Hello, everybody. And I'm, I'm one of those that put my hand up and said I've never... I have actually been into the building before, but never into this august room, so it's great to be here. Now, I actually sat next to someone at a dinner party very recently, and we managed to get into a serious argument about whether the quality of life is higher today than it was in medieval times. Um, and I had the perspective of an economist and thought the answer to this was plainly obvious. That, in fact, I was arguing that the average person today is better off than Queen Elizabeth was uh, in uh, medieval times. The other person was older than me and it was a historian and seemed awfully wise. And uh, I mean, I didn't want to push it because as an economist, we've had a very bad few years. And I, <laughs> <coughs> I thought I'd better just not get into too much of an argument. But I was delighted to find... Uh, Steven Pinker, kind of pick up something along the lines of that theme. It's not quite the same argument, but we're delighted to have him here uh, to talk about his new book, which could be called We're Not As Beastly As We Used To Be. Uh, <laughs> but he gave it a more poetic uh, title, The Better Angels of Our Nature, The Decline of Violence in History and Its cause Causes. Now, I'm very glad to meet uh, Stephen tonight. Uh, sometimes books do more than just entertain or enlighten. They kind of change the way you think about things. Uh, interestingly, his book, The Language Instinct, I don't know, have many of you read The Language Instinct? Yeah. Yep. For me, it actually flipped something in my head. And so in, suddenly, instead of thinking of things like, well, English is one kind of language, and then there are other kinds of languages that are a bit inferior or <laughs> have different qualities, uh, or it's only natural a sort of, that people would come and learn English because it's a learnable language, unlike other languages. Uh, I, I, I came around and I realised I just got it completely, completely wrong. There was a line in that book as well, which I just, I remember, about how to say that young people don't have languages, you know, don't speak as well as we do, is about as ridiculous as old spiders grumbling about how young spiders can't weave webs like the, uh, <laughs> they do anymore. And it, for some reason, it's just completely stuck with me. It is what turned me into someone who sort of views the world in a rather evolutionary, uh, psychological kind of way, and all of that. But Stephen is not here to talk about the language instinct, nor his other books, How the Mind Works, The Blank State, State The Stuff of Thought. Uh, he's going to talk about the book on violence. It's already been uh, much talked about. I'm sure you'll be glad to know, Stephen. It's in the special Amazon Media Store section, uh, which means this book is getting a lot of media attention. Um, <laughs> The phrase uh, I'm sure lots of other books uh, and authors would like to have said about theirs. Uh, it's been described by The Independent as a great liberal landmark. Um, and I mentioned that line about how in The Language Instinct he said the old spiders uh, would be stupid to berate the young spiders for not weaving webs like they used to. And in a way, that theme continues in this book with a little innate optimism about the human race. Uh, and that is clearly something we can all do with uh, at this rather depressing time. So it's a great pleasure to ask Stephen Pinker to address us. Thank you. Believe it or not, and I know most people do not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time and we may be living in the most peaceful era in our species' existence. The decline of violence has not been steady, it has not brought violence down to zero, and it is not guaranteed to continue. But I hope to persuade you that it is a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. I'm going to walk you through six major historical declines of violence identify their immediate causes, that is, particular historical events of the era, and then try to tie them together in terms of their ultimate causes, namely general historical forces interacting with human nature. The first decline of violence I call the pacification process. Until 5,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without central government. What was life like in this state of nature? Well, this is a question that thinkers have speculated uh, upon for millennia. Thomas Hobbes famously said that in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. 
A century later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that nothing can be more gentle than man in his primitive state. Now, in reality, neither of these men uh, knew what they were talking about. They had no idea what life was like in a state of nature. But today, we can do better because there are two sources of evidence about rates of violence in non-state societies. The first is forensic archaeology. You can think of this as CSI Paleolithic. <laughs> Namely, what proportion of historic skeletons, ha uh, prehistoric skeletons, have signs of violent trauma, such as bashed-in skulls, decapitations, arrowheads embedded in bones, or mummies found with ropes around their necks? Uh, here we see uh, 20 uh, of these estimates, they span quite a range, but they average out to 15%. That is, 15% of the owners of these skeletons met their end through violence. And let's compare that 15% figure to those from some uh, modern state societies. Here we have a bar for the United States and Europe uh, representing all the battle deaths in the 20th century, uh, about 6 tenths of 1%. Here we have the entire world in the 20th century aggregating all the deaths from war, the indirect effects of war, genocides, and man-made famines, and it comes in at 3%. And here is the bar for the world in the year 2005. You can't see it because it's less than a pixel high at 3 one-hundredths of 1%. The second source of evidence about violence in non-state societies comes from ethnographic vital statistics. The wave of <coughs> government that spread out from the half a dozen or so origins left a few pockets of the earth uh, in anarchy. Uh, tribal societies such as hunter-gatherers and hunter-horticulturalists. And anthropologists who live with them for extended periods of time can tally the causes of death over generations. Here I've plotted 27 uh, uh, violent death rates plotted as a uh, in terms of homicides per 100,000 people per year. Their average comes out to 524. That is, every year, one half of 1% of the people in these societies lose their li <coughs> lives to uh, violence. Uh, let's again compare this to corresponding rates for modern societies. And I'm going to pick some of the most violent societies during their most violent periods in order to stack the deck against modernity. So here, for example, we have Germany during the 20th century, with its two world wars coming in at about 160. Here's Russia in the 20th century, two world wars and a civil war at 150. Japan in the 20th century, a world war that uh, ended with two nuclear explosions at uh, 40. Here's the United States in the 20th century, two world wars and half a dozen foreign wars <laughs> at less than four. Here's the world as a whole throwing in all the direct and indirect deaths from wars, all the deaths from genocides, all the deaths from man-made famines, and it comes in at 60. <clears throat> Here's the world in the year 2005. Once again, the bar is less than a pixel high. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. The immediate cause was the rise and expansion of states, leading to the various paxes or states of peace that history students read about, the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Hispanica, and so on. The reason that the early states and empires drove down rates of violence is that tribal raiding and feuding are a nuisance to <laughs> imperial overlords. It's not as if they had a benevolent interest in the welfare of their citizens, but rather that just as a farmer has an incentive to prevent his livestock from killing each other, namely it doesn't do him any good, it's a dead loss to him, so the first kings and emperors tried to stamp out internecine uh, feuding among their subjects, who they would just as soon keep alive to provide them with taxes and soldiers and slaves. The second historical decline of violence can be appreciated by uh, examining this woodcut, which shows a day in the life in the Middle Ages. <laughs> and uh, the, the process that brought this under control has been called the civilizing process, for reasons I'll soon explain. In many parts of Europe, homicide records go back centuries, and historical criminologists such as Manuel Eisner have plotted them over time. Here I've replotted his data uh, from the year uh, 1200 to 2000 on a logarithmic scale from a tenth of a homicide per 100,000 population per year to 1 to 10 to 100. 
And as you can see, there is a massive decline in rates of homicide, so that a contemporary Englishman has about 1 35th the chance of being murdered as his medieval ancestors. This is not just a phenomenon combined, confined to England, but it is true for uh, other European regions. Here we have Italy, the Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, and Scandinavia. Here we have uh, the average of those five regions, and for the sake of comparison, I've also plotted the 524 per 100,000 per year average of the non-state societies. This gap here I've been calling the pacification process, this subsequent decline, the civilizing process. Now, I got the uh, term from a classic book by the uh, sociologist Norbert Elias. Uh, Elias argued that in the transition from Middle Age, the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms out of the patchwork of baronies and uh, principalities and duchies that had polka dotted Europe. With it, criminal justice was nationalized, and the constant feuding and raiding of warlords, otherwise known as knights, was tamed by the king's justice. Also during this transition, there was a growing infrastructure of commerce, instruments of uh, money and finance that could be recognized within the borders of these newly consolidated states, and technologies of transportation and timekeeping, that, uh, such as better carts and roads and, uh, and clocks, that lubricated uh, uh, commercial exchange. As a result, zero-sum plunder gave way to positive-sum trade, a point that I'll return to later in the lecture. The third historical decline of violence can be appreciated by considering some of the ways that the early authorities kept peace within their territories. Uh, extreme punishments such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing, sawing in half, and impalement. Uh, but in a process that's been called the humanitarian revolution, these barbaric practices were targeted for elimination. This timeline shows the abolition of judicial torture by 16 major countries. You can see that the abolitions are concentrated in the second half of the 18th century, including in the United States, the famous prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Also abolished during this period was the profligate use of the death penalty for frivolous, non-lethal crimes. 18th century England had 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a child 7 to 14 years of age. Uh, these weren't just archaic statutes in the law books, but they were exuberantly applied. Samuel Johnson, for example, writes of a seven-year-old girl who was hanged for stealing a petticoat. Uh, by 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Likewise, in 17th and 18th century America, the death penalty was used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. This graph shows the percentage of American executions for crimes other than murder from 1650 to the present. As you can see, in the early year, colonial and federal years, a majority of the executions were for crimes other than murder. More recently, the only crime other than murder that's been punished by death is conspiracy to commit murder. The death penalty itself, of course, has been abolished by most Western uh, democracies. The red timeline, extending from 1775 to 2000, shows the number of European countries that uh, still have capital punishment on the law books. But the blue line shows the number of European countries that actually carried out executions. And as you can see, well before capital punishment was uh, struck from the law books, European countries had lost their taste for applying it, uh, the, a decline that began in the 18th century. And on average, 50 years elapsed between the last actual execution and the time that people got around to uh, wiping it off the law books. The United States is notoriously an exception to the uh, abolition of capital punishment in that uh, 34 of our 50 states still have capital punishment. But it's even misleading to say that they have capital punishment because the death penalty in the United States is a shadow of its former self. This graph shows the num number of execu American executions scaled by the population. 
from 1625 to the present. And as you can see, even though capital punishment has not been abolished in the United States, it is relatively rarely applied. There are uh, approximately 45 executions per year in a country that has 17,000 homicides per year. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution, such as burning heretics at the stake, dueling, blood sports, debtors prisons, and perhaps most famously, uh, slavery. Slavery used to be legal and uh, unexceptionable everywhere in the world. All the ancient states uh, practiced slavery. Starting in the 18th century, whoops, uh, countries started to abolish slavery. This is the number of abolitions, a process that inexorably led to the last abolition of slavery as recently as 1980 in Mauritania. But uh, we are now living in an era unique in human history in which slave, chattel slavery is illegal everywhere uh, on the planet. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? One might guess that uh, it was the, the growth of affluence. It's plausible to think that as people's lives become longer and more pleasant, they place a, a higher value on their lives and by extension, a higher value on life in general. Unfortunately, the timing doesn't work. Uh, the expansion in um, affluence really only began with the uh, industrial revolution in the 19th century that led to the exponential growth of uh, income. In the 18th century, when most of these humanitarian reforms were launched, the standard of living was barely higher than what it was in the Middle Ages. Uh, a more plausible explanation is that it was the rise of printing and literacy. Book production was the only industry that showed a rise in productivity prior to the industrial revolution. This graph shows how uh, between 1500 and 1700, the efficiency in book production went up by a factor of 25, a kind of uh, early version of Moore's law. The efficiency was put into practice and an exponentially increasing number of books were published in England in the 18th century. And for the first time in history, there a majority of Englishmen could read those books. That is, literacy exceeded 50% uh, in the 18th century. Why should literacy matter? Well, this era has also been called the Enlightenment because knowledge replaced superstition and ignorance. If enough people are disabused of notions such as that Jews poison wells, heretics go to hell, witches cause crop failures, children are possessed by the devil, Africans are brutish, and so on, it will undermine many rationales for violence. As Voltaire said during this era, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, literacy is a technology of cosmopolitanism, of uh, one that lifts people out of their parochial station and exposes them to new people and ideas. And <clears throat> it's not implausible that as people read fiction and history and journalism, they start to put themselves in other people's shoes, inhabit their minds, try to imagine what life is like uh, from their point of view, and plausibly that would decrease, uh, that would increase empathy and decrease cruelty. If you're in the habit of imagining what it's like to be someone else, perhaps you'll take less pleasure in watching them be disemboweled. <laughs> the fourth uh, historical decline of violence has been called the long peace, and it speaks to the frequently made claim that the 20th century was the most violent in history. However, no one who makes this claim ever cites any numbers from any century other than the 20th, and there is reason to uh, doubt whether it's true. Take the supposedly peaceful 19th century, which is often held uh, as an uh, uh, invidious contrast to the 20th. It is true that there were two stretches of several decades of peace in which Europe had a relatively low rate of interstate war, but if you step back and you look at the century as a whole, and you look at the world as a whole, it's far from clear that the 19th century was so peaceful. The century began with the Napoleonic Wars, one of the uh, most destructive wars in Europe with four million deaths. The Taiping Rebellion in China, the most destructive civil war in history with 20 million. The most destructive war in American history, the American Civil War with 650,000 deaths. The conquests of Shaka Zulu in Southern Africa, which killed one to two million people. I don't want to leave any continent out, so 
Uh, here is one from South America, what's sometimes considered the most destructive interstate war proportionally of all time, the War of the Triple Alliance, which killed 60% of the population of Paraguay, and African slave raiding wars and imperial wars in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific, whose death tolls uh, we can't even begin to estimate. Also, while it is undoubtedly true that World War II was the deadliest event in uh, human history in terms of the absolute number of people that were killed, uh, there were a lot more people around in the 20th century, and it's not so clear that it was the deadliest event in terms of the percentage of the world population that was affected. I'm going to show you uh, the 100 worst things that people have ever done to one another that we know of, <laughs> taken from a uh, set of estimates uh, from a man who calls himself an atrocitologist, uh, <laughs> Matthew White. And I've taken his figures and I've scaled them by the population of the world at the time and plotted them in a graph from 500 BCE to 2000 CE. Uh, and as you can see, uh, World War II only comes in at ninth place and World War I doesn't even make the top ten. Moreover, history's worst atrocities are pretty evenly sprinkled over 2,500 years of human history. There is a, the data cloud does seem to funnel down as we get to the present, but presumably that's not because uh, in ancient times they only committed truly massive atrocities, whereas we commit massive and medium-sized and small atrocities. <laughs> Much more likely it's a reflection of the fact that the closer you get to the present, the more complete the historical record becomes, and that the smaller atrocities in ancient times uh, were never written down and um, remembered today. Let's zoom in on the last 500 years, period in which the, the data are more complete, and look at trends in great power war. These are the wars that involve one of the 800-pound guerrillas of the day. That is the small number of nations that can project military force beyond their own boundaries, and whose wars account for a majority of all the deaths from all wars combined. First graph from 1500 to 2000 shows the proportion of years the great powers fought each other, and the line grazes the ceiling a number of times in the 16th and 17th century, indicating that uh, it used to be that the great powers were almost always at war with each other. That's what great powers did. They, they fought other great powers. Uh, but in more uh, recent centuries, the great powers are hardly ever at war with each other. Here we have the duration of wars involving a great power, and here too the trend is downward. History used to have things like the 30 years war, the 80 years war, the 100 years war. The 20th century had the six day war. Here we have the frequency of wars involving a great power. How often would a new war uh, be hatched? And that too shows a downward trend. Here, however, is a trend that over most of this stretch shows an upward trajectory in the opposite direction, and that is, once a war begins, uh, how fast does it kill people? And this graph shows the number of battle deaths per nation year, and it, it has increased over most of this period, uh, a time which weaponry and military organization became more efficient, although after 1950, that trend as well does a U-turn, and so we've been living through a period unique in history in which the frequency of war has gone down, the duration of war has gone down, and the number of deaths per year of war have all gone down. If we combine these three graphs to tally the total number of deaths from all great power wars, we get a zigzag which terminates in the lowest point in the entire graph, showing that we're living through a period that has the lowest rate in, of uh, death in great power warfare in 500 years. Once again, let's zoom in on the period closest to the present when the data uh, become even finer grained, namely the uh, 20th century. Here we see that this graph aggregates deaths from uh, all wars, not just great power wars. But uh, while it's undoubtedly true that the century had two bloodbaths corresponding to the two world wars, they did, were not part of an escalating trend, nor even a new normal, but rather something closer to a last gasp. And for the last two-thirds of a century, we've been living through a period where the line pretty much hugs the floor. Uh, this is the period called the Long Peace, the historically unprecedented decline in interstate war, wars between two countries. There were no wars between the two greatest powers of them all, the 
United States and the Soviet Union, defying every expert prediction that a third world war was uh, inevitable. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki, again, confounding the prediction of every expert that World War III would be a nuclear war. There have been no wars between any of the great powers since the end of the Korean War in 1953. There have been no wars between Western European countries uh, since the end of World War II, a fact that I often have to emphasize is uh, worth noting, because we've grown up in an era where you might think, well, of course France and Germany aren't going to go to war. Why would they ever do something like that? But needless to say, this is a historically highly unusual state of affairs. Uh, before 1945, Western European countries started two new wars a year for 600 years. <laughs> After 1945, that went to zero. And there have been no wars between developed countries, the uh, 40 countries with the highest GDP per capita. Again, it's all too easy to take that fact for granted. We've grown up in an era where wars are things that happen down in those poor primitive parts of the world. But it wasn't always so. It used to be the richest countries that were constantly at war, and rich countries because they can afford better militaries, can do a lot more damage. Well, what about the rest of the world? In a process that I've called the new peace, the long peace is starting to spread to the rest of the world. Let me explain the, the trends. Since 1946, as I've mentioned, there have been fewer interstate wars all over the world. However, there have been more civil wars, as newly independent states with inept governments defended themselves against insurgent movements, and both sides were armed, uh, financed, and egged on by the Cold War superpowers. Let me show you these trends in a stacked layer graph where the thickness of the layer corresponds to the number of wars in a given year from 1946 to 2009, and where in this graph a war is defined as an armed conflict with a government on at least one side that results in as few as 25 deaths a year. The red wedge represents the number of colonial wars, a category of war that no longer exists since the European powers have given up their colonies. Here we have the number of interstate wars, wars with a government on each side, and that has been dwindling downward. But here we have the number of civil wars, both the number of pure civil wars that are fought uh, only by forces within the country, and internationalized civil wars, where some external country butts in to help the government defend itself against the rebels. Note, though, that even the number of civil wars has shown a decline since the end of the Cold War in uh, around 1990. But the key question is, which wars kill more people? The uh, civil wars that have uh, burgeoned, or the interstate wars, which have almost disappeared? And this graph provides the answer. Here we have the uh, number of battle deaths per conflict per year for the interstate wars, which used to be uh, very destructive, but have declined uh, with the disappearance of interstate war. Here we have the internationalized civil wars and the pure civil wars. And what you can see is that a typical civil war kills far fewer people per year than the interstate wars that the world used to have to live with. If we now combine these two figures, how many wars there were, with how, much how many people were killed in each of the wars, and simply add up the deaths, we get a stacked layer graph that looks like this. Here, are the deaths for, here is the death rate from colonial wars, which tapers down to nothing. Here we have the deaths from interstate wars, which show a, a bumpy but unmistakably downward trajectory. This spike includes the Korean War, this one the Vietnam War, this one the Iran-Iraq War. And here we have the pure civil wars and the internationalized civil wars, showing that even with the expansion in the number of civil wars, the total number of people killed is far less than it used to be. The first decade of the 21st century has a uh, paper-thin laminate hugging the floor, showing that the dream of the 1960s folk singers is starting to come true. The world has almost put an end to war. Well, what about genocide? It's often said that more people were killed in the 20th century in genocides than in wars. Indeed, the 20th century has often been called the age of genocide. Once again, though, this is a claim based on examining only the 20th century. And historians who have 
looked back for signs of genocide in previous centuries, unanimously uh, dismiss the claim that the 20th century was the age of genocide. I'm going to read to you from page one of one of these histories, Frank Chalk and Kurt Jonason's The History of Genocide. Genocide has been practiced in all regions of the world and during all periods in history. We know that in ancient times, empires have disappeared and that cities were destroyed, but we do not know what happened to the bulk of the populations involved in these events. Their fate was simply too unimportant. When they were mentioned at all, they were usually lumped together with the herds of oxen, sheep, and other livestock. Looking at the available evidence from antiquity, one might develop a hypothesis that most wars at that time were genocidal in character. What has changed is that for the first time, historians have become interested in genocide and count it as a significant historical uh, event. What are some examples? Well, if you take old, the uh, Old Testament seriously, there's a genocide every few pages. Uh, <laughs> commanded by God, who instructs the Israelites to put every living thing to the edge of the sword, every last man, woman, and child, resulting in the extermination of the Amalekites, Amorites, Canaanites, Hivites, Hittites, and so on. Now, I don't believe that these events took place. There's no archaeological evidence for them. Uh, on the other hand, it does record a common practice of the time, and it does record a common attitude of the time. Namely, genocide is an excellent thing, as long as it doesn't happen to you. More historically plausible are the massacres by the Athenians in Melos, the uh, Romans in Carthage, the Mongol invasions, the Crusades, the European wars of religion, and the colonization of the Americas, Africa, and Australia. In the 20th century, there we do have some estimates of the trajectory of genocide, and they can help speak to the commonly made assertion that the recent genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda mean that the world has learned nothing from the Holocaust and that uh, the planet is as genocidal as ever. Uh, this graph uh, puts the lie to that assertion. It's undoubtedly true that there was a horrendous bloodbath in the middle decades of the 20th century, but the trajectory has been bumpily downward, and once again, here in the uh, 21st century, there is a relatively low rate of death by genocide by uh, historical standards. What were the immediate causes of the long peace and the new peace? <clears throat> well, three of them were uh, thrown out by Immanuel Kant in his essay, Perpetual Peace, in 1795, <clears throat> excuse me, in which he suggested that democracy, trade, and an international community all changed the incentive structure to disincentivize countries from waging war. More recently, Bruce Russett and John O'Neill have tested Kant's hypotheses and have found that all three of these pacifying forces have increased in the second half of the 20th century, and all of them are statistical predictors of peace, holding everything else constant in a regression an analysis. Here we see the number of uh, democracies and the number of autocracies worldwide from 1946 to the present. As you can see, the number of democracies has increased steadily and now uh, largely outnumbers the number of autocracies. This wasn't always uh, apparent, and in the dark days of the 1970s, when the trend seemed to be going in the opposite direction, Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote an article in which he claimed that democracy was going the way of monarchy. It was a nice idea while it lasted, but it was a form of government that was doomed. Uh, and happily, he turned out to be mistaken. Here we see international trade from the late 19th century to the present as a proportion of GDP, which shows a huge takeoff in international trade following the Second World War. And here we have membership in intergovernmental organizations, which has also uh, increased throughout the 20th century with a bit of an acceleration uh, after World War uh, II. Uh, finally, uh, this graph shows a different kind of international community. The closest thing we have to an international police force, namely peacekeeping missions, such as the blue hem helmeted soldiers of the United Nations forces. Uh, this too shows an increase, particularly after the end of the Cold War, both in the number of operations, but more importantly in the number of soldiers, making them more effective. And contrary to a widespread stereotype, uh, peacekeepers really do keep the peace. Not always, there have been some conspicuous failures, but far more often than when the two sides are left to fight it out to the bitter end. <clears throat>
Finally, there's a historical development that I call the rights revolutions. The targeting of violence on smaller scales develop, uh, 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 aimed at vulnerable sectors of the population, such as racial minorities, women, children, homosexuals, and animals. The civil rights movement in America put an end to the uh, practice of lynching, which used to take place at a rate of 150 a year in the late 19th century. By 1950, the number had been driven down to zero. Since the 1990s, the FBI has uh, counted hate crime murders of blacks. They were never very prevalent to begin with, about five per year. Even that has dwindled down to uh, one. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks have declined since they were first measured crimes like intimidation and assault, and the kind of racist attitudes that would often license violence against uh, racial minorities has been in steady decline. Here we have the results of a, uh, opinion polls that ask white Americans, do you believe that black and white students should go to separate schools? And would you move if a black family moved in next door? And in both cases, there has been a decline since the 1940s that has continued uh, pushed the approval rate down to the single digits, the rate of crank opinion, and the questions are not even included in modern surveys. It, this is a, seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, this graph shows the number of countries that discriminate against ethnic minorities in their laws, and that's been in steady decline. The blue line shows the number of uh, countries that have bent over backwards in the opposite direction with various affirmative action or remedial discrimination policies that favor their disadvantaged ethnic minorities. In the world today, more countries uh, try to help their disadvantaged minorities than discriminate against them. The women's rights movement has seen an 80% decline in rape in the United States since the, it was first measured in the 1970s. A two-thirds decrease in domestic violence, particularly directed against female victims, and uh, I have a similar graph in the book from statistics, with statistics from the UK. A decline in the most extreme form of domestic violence, namely axoricide, the murder of uh, a wife, and mariticide, the murder of a husband. Uh, the rates have declined for both female victims and male victims, although you'll see that the decline is steeper for male victims. Uh, the women's movement has been very, very good for husbands. <laughs> the children's rights movement has seen a steady decline in the number of American states that allow uh, paddling and strapping and other forms of corporal punishment in school. Every uh, public opinion poll in the West has shown a decline in the approval and the use of smacking and spanking and other forms of, of, of violence against children. And there's been a decline in both physical abuse and sexual abuse since these uh, practices were first measured in 1990, and a decline in uh, the amount of violence that children perpetrate against each other in, uh, in the form of fights and non-fatal crimes at school. The gay rights movement has seen an increase in the number of states that have decriminalized homosexuality, both nation states across the world and American states, which is now at 100%. Uh, every public opinion poll has shown a decrease in anti-gay attitudes, such as whether people consider homosexuality to be morally wrong, uh, whether it should be criminalized, and whether gay people should be denied equal opportunity. Uh, hate crime intimidations directed against gay people have been in decline since they were first measured. And the animal rights movement has seen a decline in hunting, an increase in vegetarianism, both in the UK and the US, and a sharp decrease in the number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed. <laughs> well, all of this now raises the question, why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? One possibility is that human nature has changed and that somehow our taste for violence has literally been bred out of us. For many reasons, I consider this possibility unlikely. One of them is that our uh, children still seem to uh, engage in plenty of violence. A large proportion of two-year-olds hit, bite, and kick, and uh, play fighting in boys is one of the uh, biggest and most universal gender differences. Grown-up little boys and little girls 
take enormous enjoyment in vicarious violence, such as murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, hockey, <laughs> and movies starring a certain ex-governor of California. <laughs> and then there are homicidal fantasies. A number of so social psychologists have asked their subjects the following question. Have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Say, someone who has stolen your boyfriend or girlfriend, or someone who's humiliated you in public. Turns out that 15% of women and a third of men frequently fantasize about <laughs> killing people they don't like. And more than 60% of women and three quarters of men at least occasionally fantasize about <laughs> killing people they don't like. And the rest of them are lying. <laughs> A more likely possibility is that human nature has always been extraordinarily complex and that it comprises both inclinations toward violence and inclinations that counteract them, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, and that historical circumstances have increasingly favored peaceable inclinations that have been around the whole time. What are the motives for violence? There's exploitation. The uh, pure calculating elimination of a person that haps, happens to be an obstacle on the path to something that you want, resulting in rape, plunder, conquest, and the elimination of rivals. There's dominance, the drive to climb the pecking order and become alpha male, played out at the level of individuals, and the corresponding competition pay, played out among groups for ethnic, racial, national, or religious supremacy. There's moralistic violence, various kinds of revenge that deem it not just permissible but mandatory to harm someone who has committed some infraction, resulting in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. And then there are ideologies uh, that proliferate, belief systems that proliferate through a population, such as militant religions, nationalism, Nazism, and communism, which license vast uh, outlays of violence by a kind of utopian cost-benefit analysis. Uh, imagine that your belief system holds out the prospect of a world that will be infinitely good forever. Well, how much violence are you entitled to perpetrate in order to bring about that infinitely perfect world? Well, as much as you want, and you're always ahead of the game. Uh, also, imagine that there are uh, people who hear about your scheme for an infinitely perfect world and uh, don't get with the program. They might even uh, oppose you and stand in the way of your, bringing your, of your bringing your own dreams to reality. Well, if they're the only ones standing in the way of an infinitely uh, perfect world, how evil are they? Well, you do the math. Uh, and it's for, this, for these reasons that paradoxically, it's been utopian ideologies that have often resulted in the true outliers in uh, the uh, history's atrocities. What do we have to combat these inner demons? What are the better angels of our nature? Well, there's self-control, the ability to anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit violent impulses, presumably explaining why 75% of men uh, fantasize about killing people, but a, needless to say, a far, far smaller number actually do kill people. There's empathy, the ability to feel others' pain. There's the moral sense, a family of intuitions, some of which can actually increase violence, such as tribalism, authority, and puritanism, but at least one of which, a sense of fairness, can decrease violence. And then there's reason, cognitive processes that allow us to engage in object, objective, detached analysis of how we should live our lives. The crucial question then is, which historical developments bring out our better angels and stay our hands before they can commit acts of bloodshed. The first possibility is that Hobbes got it right when he called for a Leviathan, a state and judicial system with a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, which can eliminate the incentives for exploitative attack by penalizing an aggressor and therefore canceling out his anticipated gain. Uh, that can calm everyone down as they come to realize that not only are you uh, punished for aggression, but so is your neighbor. And uh, outsourcing uh, vengeance to the state can reduce the total amount of vengeance because it uh, reduces the need 
for the temptation to preempt, preemptive attack, that is, wiping them out before they can wipe you out. It reduces the need to maintain a belligerent stance in order to deter attacks on you. And it reduces the need to follow through on vengeance and to avenge blood with uh, blood. Uh, the, the reason that vengeance outsourced to the state is bound to be less bloody than vengeance uh, when each side serves as judge, jury, and executioner is that we are all prone to self-serving biases. Everyone always believes that their opponent's attacks are naked, unprovoked aggression, whereas their own attacks are justified retaliation. And when you have two sides both in the throes of these self-serving uh, illusions, you can have endless cycles of vendetta and feuding. Some historical evidence for the effectiveness of the Leviathan comes from the civilizing and pacifying effects of states that I mentioned in the first two historical developments, and the fact that you can watch this movie run in reverse when states retreat and leave behind zones of anarchy, which are almost inevitably highly violent, such as the American Wild West, where the cliche was that the nearest sheriff is 90 miles away, so you have to defend yourself with your own six-shooter. Uh, failed states, collapsed empires, and mafias and street gangs that are uh, engaged in illegal contraband trades that don't allow them to avail themselves of the dispute resolution apparatus of the state. If you're dealing in cocaine and you feel you've been cheated on a business deal, it's not as if you can press a lawsuit. Uh, or if you feel uh, threatened, you can't d call the police to, uh, to, to save you. And so illegal activities often uh, give rise to zones of violent anarchy uh, because a credible threat of violence is one's only defense against being uh, cheated. The second possibility has been called gentle commerce. The idea is that plunder is a zero-sum game. The victor's gain is the vanquished's loss, whereas trade can be a positive-sum game, one in which everybody wins. And as improving technology allows the trade of goods and ideas over longer distances, among larger groups of people, and at lower cost, more and more of the rest of the world becomes more valuable alive than dead. Uh, much has been written about the impending uh, rivalry between the United States and China as the dominant world power, but I doubt that they're actually going to fight a shooting war, uh, among other things. They make all our stuff, and we owe, owe them too much money. <laughs> Some historical evidence comes from regression analyses showing that countries with open economies and greater dependence on international trade are embroiled in fewer wars, are riven by fewer civil wars, and host fewer genocides. A third possibility, uh, first suggested by Charles Darwin, but named the expanding circle by Peter Singer, is that evolution bequeathed us with a sense of empathy. But unfortunately, by default, we apply it only to a narrow circle of blood relatives, uh, close allies, and adorable little things like babies and cute fuzzy animals. Uh, but over history, one can see the circle of empathy expanding to the village, the clan, the tribe, the nation, other races, both sexes, children, and perhaps eventually to other species. This just begs the question of what caused the circle to inflate continuously. And it, it's plausible that the technologies of cosmopolitanism that I mentioned earlier uh, were a cause, that the consumption of history, literature, and uh, journalism. And laboratory experiments have shown that if people adopt the perspective of a real or fictitious other person by reading or listening to their uh, stories recounted in the first person, they become more sympathetic to that individual, but also to the entire category of people that that individual represents. Some historical evidence includes the fact that the humanitarian reforms of the 18th century were preceded by the Republic of Letters, the uh, dense interchange of information via print. The second half of the 20th century, with the long peace and the rights revolutions, were also the age of the electronic global village. And in the 20th century, 21st century, it's too early to know whether the color revolutions in the Arab Spring will have a happy ending, but uh, it's 
unquestionable that they were fostered by the rise of the internet and social media. Finally, there's the escalator of reason, the possibility that the centuries-long growth of, in literacy, education, and public discourse has encouraged people to think more abstractly and more universally. That is, they rise above their parochial vantage point. This makes it harder to privilege their own interests over those of others. It encourages them to replace a morality based on tribalism, authority, and puritanism with a morality based on fairness and universal rules. It allows them to stand back and recognize the futility of cycles of violence, and increasingly to see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Some historical evidence includes the little known fact that abstract reasoning abilities, as measured by IQ tests, uh, have increased over the course of the 20th century, the so-called Flynn effect, by which IQ scores have increased by three IQ points per decade throughout the 20th century. Other studies have shown that people and societies with higher levels of education and measured intelligence, holding all else constant, commit fewer violent crimes, cooperate more in experimental games, have more classically liberal attitudes, such as uh, resistance to racism and xenophobia, and are more receptive to democracy 10 years down the line. The final question I'll address is why so many forces seem to be pushing in the same direction, that is, in reducing violence. And I think the answer is that violence is what game theorists might call a social dilemma. Namely, it's always tempting to an aggressor to uh, enjoy the ill-gotten gains of picking on a victim, but of course it's ruinous to the victim. Since in the long run, anyone can be either an aggressor or a victim, all parties would be better off if they could just somehow all agree to avoid violence. The human dilemma is how to get the other guy to refrain from violence at the same time as you do. Because if you unilaterally lay down your arms, you could be a sitting duck. One can well imagine that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually uh, tamed this problem, just like we've dealt with other scourges of nature, like pestilence and hunger. And in fact, all of the pacifying forces that I invoked increase the material, emotional, or cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence simultaneously. Well, whatever the causes of the decline of violence turn out to be, I think that the phenomenon has implications that are profound. For one thing, they call for a reorientation of our efforts toward violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. Perhaps instead of asking, why is there war, we should ask, why is there peace? Not just, what are we doing wrong, but what have we been doing right? Because we have been doing something right, and it sure would be good to know what exactly it is. Also, I think the decline of violence calls for a reassessment of modernity of the centuries-long current that has eroded family, tribe, tradition, and religion, and replaced it with individualism, cosmopolitanism, reason, and science. Now, everyone acknowledges that modernity has brought us certain gifts, longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, richer experiences. But there's always been a thread of nostalgia and romanticism that questions the price whether it's worth it if we have to live in fear of terrorism, genocide, world wars, and nuclear weapons. On the other hand, if despite impressions, the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, I believe this calls for a rehabilitation of the ideal of modernity and progress, and it's a cause for gratitude for the institutions of civilization and enlightenment that have made it possible. Thank you very much.